I want you to imagine that you've worked really hard your entire life. You've been a saver. You've done all the right things, made those decisions, the hard decisions to save, and you've invested your capital in the market. This is the stock market crash of the Great Depression, where investors lost 87% in three years. This stock market crash almost took out the father of value investing, Benjamin Graham. Both Sir John and Warren Buffett are well-known students of Benjamin Graham, but it almost demolished even the father of value investing. Here's a graph of the 1970s bear market. This decline is only 48%. Would you be a buyer at the bottom? If you think so, remember that this stock market crash occurred with runaway inflation, skyrocketing, skyrocketing unemployment, oil embargoes, gas shortages, and rationing. What would have been your perspective at the bottom of this market? Would you be buying stocks? or would you be hiding under your desk? This next graph is a graph of Black Monday, which occurred in 1987. This is a well-known crash in the market. The, market, the Dow Jones lost 22% in one day. Now, I actually remember this crash. My dad was a stockbroker at Dean Witter Reynolds, and I remember being in the living room at home with my mother. My dad came home from work and he asked her to step outside in the hall and he closed the door. And I imagine that he told her that they had lost probably 25% of their net worth that day. It was not a sad day in our home though. I just remember him doing that. Uncle John was well known on this day for saying this is going to make our returns for years to come. He was a buyer that day. Now, my husband did a recent revision of the book, The Templeton Touch, and when he was writing that book, we went and interviewed a lot of famous money managers that knew my uncle. And we interviewed one of his old employees um, named Marty Flanagan. Marty is now the CEO of Invesco, but Marty said, on the day of the crash in 1987, Uncle John got up, left the office to go walk in the surf for an hour. He did that every single day. A lot of value investors, as you know, Saurabh, have this built into their daily schedule, whether it's Monish's nap room or some type of physical activity. But he got up like it was no other day, and he left, and he went and walked in the surf. And when he came back to the office, he was greeted by a bunch of young analysts who said, Sir John, Sir John, don't you see what the market has done? How could you have left the office? And he said, boys, sit down. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we're in a bear market. The good news is it's almost over. Now, we've also interviewed a broker that had an open line to his office that day, and that broker tracked all the purchases in, his, in a ledger and calculated the return two years later, and Uncle John had made 200% on those investments that day. Now, if you had just held on to your um, investments, the Dow was back up um, to where it was before the crash two years later. If you had invested um, in an index tracking the Dow at the bottom, you would have had a 60% return off the bottom. So just something remember during these events. This is the dot-com bubble crash um, where the market lost 50%. This is the S&P 500. The NASDAQ lost almost 80% during this crash. I also remember this one well as I was working as a sales assistant at Morgan Stanley to two technical analysts. It's kind of the antithesis of all things Templeton. But I was there, and the wealth effect was in full view. I mean, there were steak dinners and champagne nights, and there was a new IPO every day. People were so excited. And I made the regrettable error of going down to the Lyford Key Club and meeting with my uncle and asking him, what tech stocks are you buying? And he just shook his head at me and he said, you know, Lauren, when I was a child, I would walk from my house in Winchester, Tennessee to the town square and my brother would go with me and we would gather in the yard of a home and lots of people would gather. 
And eventually the owner would come out and flip a switch and lights would come on and light up the house. And that was the spread of electricity. He said, now I went back and calculated it and the time to get out of those stocks was two years prior to that. And then he walked me through every bubble he had seen in his lifetime. And he told me on that day that he was shorting tech stocks, which took you know, a lot of courage during that market. Um, but he was using a strategy referred to as the IPO lockup strategy. So he knew that even the, the insiders of these companies knew their companies were overvalued and that they would take the first, the first chance they got to sell the shares. So he would short stock seven days prior to the IPO lockup expiration and cover about 10 days later. I never asked him how much money he had on during that trade, but we've heard he had 40, 400 million in short positions and that he made over 90% on many or most of those trades. So that was a really interesting time. And then of course you all remember the most recent financial crisis where we had almost a 57% market correction. Now that was a great day for me. Um, actually was pregnant with my first born, born child during that, and she was born on March 10th, 2009. The market lows were on March 9th, 2009. So I remember vividly buying stocks in the delivery room, and the nurse came in and told my husband to shut down the computer. And I looked at him and said, did you get the orders filled? Because we had been buying stocks for months prior to that event, and we knew that the markets were being really irrational with valuations, and we wanted to buy as much as we could. Now, market corrections um, and crashes are a staple to the market. They're going to happen. It's not if, it's when. So since 1900, there have been 125 corrections. Um, corrections are defined as a drawdown of 10% or more peak to trough. There have been 32 bear markets defined as a 20% drawdown or more peak to trough. Um, so you're going to spend about one third of your life in bear markets. Bear markets come along every three to three and a half years. Corrections come along every year. Really good investors have learned to harness those, the power of the bear market to boost their returns for years to come. That's really what distinguishes um, an average, an inv average investor from a great investor. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term, homo economicus, but despite looking just a bit like my husband in college, it's actually an academic term used to define man as a perfectly rational wealth maximizer with the infinite capacity for rational decision making. I mean, do you think homo economicus exists? I don't. And despite that, homo economicus is used all the time in finance and economics. So most of Western philosophy and academia preaches Plato's mind-body split and the predominance of rational thinking. Students in business school are taught to calculate risk using standard deviation and beta, and homo economicus really supports this model. But value investors say, no, we don't buy that. You know, intrinsic value often differs from price. Risk is simply paying too much for a security. And really, the returns bear this out. The returns support a value investor's perspective. Here we have a graph showing the 20-year annualized returns by asset class. And as you can see, stocks had returned 9.9%, bonds 6.2%, gold 5.8, oil 5.6, international stocks 5%, and homes 3.1%. The average investor, 2.5%. Now, how is that possible if all these asset classes outperform the average investor? It's because people are really terrible decision makers. 
and they're oftentimes buying high and selling low. Um, now, I'm a really good Southern girl, and I was raised on a diet of BLTs. But in my family, we called them Buffett, Lynch, and Templetons. These are three of the greatest investors, and they're track records, and they are remarkable. I think one thing to highlight is that Warren Buffett has an incredible um, vehicle for investing. Peter Lynch and Sir John both manage mutual funds. Mutual funds are terrible vehicles for the manager because people are always giving you money at the wrong time and taking it away, away at the wrong time. So they're very, very difficult to manage. And this is a really important point. So Peter Lynch, um, when he was annualizing 29%, conducted a study. And he wanted to know what the average investor in Magellan had earned. And what he found was that the average investor had earned 5% and many had actually lost money. He was annualizing 29%. So again, investors are constantly doing the wrong thing. When a manager runs up, they give them money. When the manager draws down, they take it away. And that's how the average investor earned 5% or lost money when the product they were investing in was annualizing 29